Well, thanks for being a part of this One Jack community conversation. I'm Kyle Reese, along with my colleagues Nancy Bronner and JC Wilbach. And in this time of COVID-19, One Jack is committed to bring community leaders together and find out all of the good work that continues to go on in our city. So thanks for being a part of our uh, podcast today. And today we have on uh, our podcast Linda Levin, who is the CEO of Elder Source. So why don't we start, Linda, with um, why don't you share what Elder Source is and what you do and how long you've been with Elder Source? Sure. So thank you, Nancy, and I'm glad to do this with you today. Uh, Elder Source is a nonprofit. We are designated by the state of Florida to be the Area Agency on Aging and the Aging and Disability Resource Center for seven counties in Northeast Florida. We get state and federal funding to provide home and community-based services for seniors living in the community to help them live in age with independence and dignity. And then we enter into contracts with local providers who do these services and we make sure they're a good quality service. Those in greatest economic and social need get the services and that we're um, being good stewards of the funding. We then have as an aging and disability resource center, a helpline, which is really critical, particularly now, uh, all year of course, but more so during a disaster, whether it's um, a pandemic or a hurricane or anything of that sort. Uh, people call our helpline, older adults and adults with disabilities age 18 and older to get connected to resources, um, to be assessed, to be um, connected. Um, we help caregivers and so forth. So and that's our Aging and Disability Resource Center. I've been with the um, Elder Source now for a little over 16 years. Wow. Yeah, well, it's great when you have a great team to work with. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And this helpline, so, um, are, are, have your calls gone way up during the pandemic, Linda? The calls have increased. Uh, people um, who are looking, it's a, it's, they're different calls. The calls we get during the year have been for those home and community-based services. Um, and now we're getting people who normally would be fine during the year and don't need those services, but because of this particular crisis, which is keeping them at home, um, they're needing assistance. Some of the seniors who were working, were furloughed, laid off, um, um, had a reduction in hours and income, just like everybody else. So being dependent on their income are struggling with their bills that they may not have otherwise. Not being able to go to the grocery store and feeling safe and getting food and supplies that they need. Um, we have a concern now with the impact of the long term, the long term impact on older adults emotionally and psychologically. So people calling us for help in that area as well. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering about the obviously we know in this time that that seniors are a very vulnerable population uh, when it comes to COVID-19. But I, I'm wondering about the the mental aspect that you just mentioned. What what seniors are dealing with the isolation and, and then how are, how are they overcoming that? Right. So it's a concern all the time of older adults who live alone and are isolated, but we're seeing more now. And it's this prolonged isolation and the impact it has, um, that sense of loneliness um, and what that brings, depression and, um, you know, unfortunately, also even thoughts of suicide because they're so stressed and depressed and lonely. So not in every case, but it, ha it comes up. So we have been working with our providers who we contract with to do mental health counseling. Um, we work with a particular provider right now, Aging True, who is able to do that through telehealth um, because people don't necessarily want someone coming into the home and they're also not able to go to get the service. So our providers are able to do telehealth, mental health counseling. Also our providers and even our own staff are doing telephone reassurance. So making sure we have a regular phone call and contact with seniors so that they don't feel so isolated. And then we also have what is a virtual caregiver support group. So caregivers 
Again, we have that during the course of the year for caregivers who can't get to a support group, but now no senior caregiver could get to a support group. So we have a virtual support group when we use Zoom. We use a platform like this to be able to connect caregivers in a room together virtually with a facilitator. And that helps with that sense of isolation as well. Other things older adults are doing on their own and family members and relatives, um, friends, neighbors could do is they could do their own phone calls. They could do Zoom. They could do, if they have the Echo um, platform, they could drop in and, and see each other as well. Um, so there are opportunities and ways that people can connect. And that connection, while physically separated, that social connection can still be there and is so important. Mm -hmm. And you know, this isolation, I mean, this pandemic, is going to go on for the foreseeable future. Um, how do you see, you know, supporting these seniors? You're doing it now, you know, especially this idea of them being so isolated in the first place, and then now without even being able to have that human connection. I mean, six months, a year, how, how are you going to manage to support them in the future? Well, that's being discussed right now. Um, seniors, for instance, who before were going to senior centers and meal sites, those all closed in all seven of our counties. So they're not even able to get that socialization there. They're getting meals. Um, either they're driving by and picking them up or they're being delivered to their home now. Um, so we've, we've lost that contact, that ability to see them and have them participate in group activities. Each of our counties are going to have to make that determination on their own as to when and how they reopen. And I'm sure we will work with them to make sure they reopen in compliance with the CDC guidelines and making sure that um, there's proper protections in place. But seniors then also have to feel comfortable going back if and when those centers reopen. Um, the Best thing we could do right now until that happens is continue to make sure that our providers in our counties, as well as our staff, continue to reach out and have conversations with them and encourage the community to do their part to reach out to their loved ones and friends um, and neighbors to keep some type of connection. And there are things that they could do. I know my parents' neighborhood, they're in their 80s, and they did, in their little cul-de-sac, a virtual uh, happy hour. And all the neighbors on their little cul-de-sac, including my parents, came out with their drinks and they socialized uh, with each other, but with a safe distance. Yeah. yeah. There are things that people could do. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard about you know, all the different ways. So we just need to make sure the community is helping with that. Mm -hmm. As, as, as we've gone through this pandemic now for uh, what seems like ages, but it's a, a couple of months, are you beginning to think about how your work in the community is going to be forever changed by COVID-19 and, and, and what that's going to look like? Oh, yes. <laughs> so we, we are now in our eighth week ourselves of working remotely. Um, which includes our helpline. I mean, we're, we've operated the entire time and remain uh, operating. Um, we are anticipating our own operations that we will stay working remotely because we can safely. But we are right now in the process of doing medium and long-term planning on how do we return to the office? Do we return to the office? In what capacity what has to be put in place? Because we do have seniors who have come to our office for help. So how do we do that safely? We've been doing it remotely, it's been challenging. Can we get back so that people could come by and get some assistance? We wanna make sure we could do that safely. But we see technology being a big part of how we do that during COVID and even post COVID. We see um, things changing for how we operate um, even post COVID. One of our providers is AHEC, the Area Health Education Council. And as an example of how things have changed, 
they would do evidence-based health and wellness programs in person, in groups of eight to 10 or more people. They're doing those virtually now. Okay. So they've had to do it under these circumstances, but even when they go back to doing them in person, in person, not all seniors were even able to participate to get to some place where they could participate in an in-person workshop. So they may continue doing virtual workshops that they weren't doing before, that they learned they could do. Now, they may continue and be able to serve a group of seniors with those workshops virtually, even if they do go back to the live um, in-person um, type of workshop. And what so kind technology? I'm wondering too. All three of us at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, following up on that, is access to technology a, a challenge for a good portion of seniors or for a small portion? It is, it is a challenge for uh, many older adults. Um, older adults living in rural communities might not have the connectivity uh, that they would need. Um, Low-income older adults would not have um, access to the technology and some just might not be comfortable with it. But many are, um, many are. And so there is a population that we are able to serve and we wanna make sure we can use the technology to serve them. Um, grandchildren, um, other you know, students from the university can certainly help with that. Um, and I think as we see the younger, older adult, you know, move into older, older adult, um, we're going to see more seniors um, using technology in, our, in the future than we have been. So we need to embrace it. We need to make it work for those who can use it and then be prepared to do what we can to come back to delivering services in person when we know it's safe to do that for them. Yeah. So that, that might be an area of, uh, that the community could volunteer to help. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like it sounds like you have a lot of areas where community members could play a role by volunteering, even something as simple as calling a senior to check on them, to chat about their um, how they're doing, and just this socialization area. But I'm particularly attracted to the idea of the college students or students, uh, you know, helping seniors with technology. So how can people help? Well, so if they want to volunteer, um, they could call our office or go to our website. We have a volunteer coordinator um, and she does um, try to figure out how they could best help. She also oversees our Caring Connections, which is our telephone reassurance program. Um, she also helps recruit volunteers for our SHINE program. And that is the health insurance counseling program. Health if they do education and counseling related to Medicare benefits. And we still have people turning 65 every day who need Medicare. And some of the benefits have changed. So getting that information out, counselors were seeing people in person. They're now doing that virtually, mm -hmm. like everything else. Mm -hmm. And so we need um, more volunteers who could do that. So anyone who wants to volunteer to help seniors for either of those programs or just want to get involved somehow can reach out to us and either we'll connect them to one of our programs or to one of our providers who might have an opportunity for them. We, uh, all of our organizations have had to make, make some sort of pivot in this time. And um, we want to give you a chance to brag on your organization. So tell us a success story that's happened over these last two months that you're particularly proud of. Well, there are a lot, actually. Um, I think first is the fact that what we learned we could do, we learned we could take 55 people and put them at home and still be operational and still have a helpline where people could still call us. Yeah. And um, we didn't know we had that in us and we do, because <laughs> we had to, and it's been great. And it's uh, to be able to continue to help during this time in and of itself is a success story. But another is um, the collaboration that we've been able to participate in with other community partners to get the help out there. Farm Share, 
feeding Northeast Florida, providing um, food and um, toiletries and um, Humana and Florida Blue and United who have provided funding and bags and sanitizers that we could deliver to seniors. Um, elite transportation has been helping to transport the bags we've been putting together to get out into the community. Um, the Jacksonville Iceman did a fundraiser um, for us. They did a 5K so we can fund services. Um, we're partnering, in fact, with Meals on Wings at UNF to, <laughs> yeah. to deliver meals to seniors during this time. And we're collaborating with the American Heart Association who is providing blood pressure cuffs to go with those meals for seniors and education on blood pressure and AHEC is doing education around it. Um, so many partners have just come together. Seniors on a Mission has stepped up to help deliver meals and packages that we provide for them to deliver to seniors. Um, it's, the, it's the community collaboration in and of itself has just been, I think, a really great example of success and how we've been able to help people. The First Coast Relief Fund, and we also have funding from the Jim Moran Foundation. Immediately within a week of us working remotely, reached out and um, provided funding. That has allowed us to deliver services, but we couldn't do it without the collaboration. And our partners, our providers who we contract with, um, we're working with them and restaurants. When restaurants had to cut back on their staff, um, we're able to partner with our funding and our providers are working with restaurants to supplement the meals our providers were delivering with meals from restaurants and having that delivered. Uh, we weren't able to do that before. Um, the state and the feds, federal government have relaxed some of the requirements that have allowed this type of collaboration to take place. And we get car, I get cards every day, um, you know, in the mail. <laughs> Thank you notes um, and emails and messages on our website from folks who have just been benefiting and so appreciative. And I don't know what could be better than, than that. Yeah. Well, Linda, you're, you're certainly on the front line of serving uh, a, a most vulnerable population and um, you're doing so much at a time when so much is needed. So thank you for being with us, taking a bit of time to share with our community the work of Elder Source and, uh, and inviting people to volunteer uh, by going to your website, by calling and uh, seeing what we can all do to pull together and support our senior population. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks thank a cute you. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.